All right. First of all, I want to thank you both for being with us today. Uh, quite an important subject, a kind of a squishy subject. Definitions uh, change, depend on who's <laughs> doing the defining. So my first question, I guess, would be uh, to you, Mr. Stover. What is your definition of critical race theory? Well, a definition of critical race, as far as I and our organization is concerned, Russ, has to do with what is we see being taught uh, primarily in the public schools now, and it's a very divisional term where you have um, those that are white being told that in many cases they should be considered the oppressor. They were born with white privilege. And uh, when you look at uh, those that are black or brown uh, colored, uh, they are considered to be the oppressed. And this is the concern that we have. Of course, as we know, critical race, and I know Dr. Jeffries uh, knows this better than I, uh, that uh, this came back, uh, came around in the 1980s in, at the college level by Dr. Bell. And uh, uh, this is something that they've decided now across the country to start bringing into the public school systems. Well, uh, Dr. Jeffries, let me ask you, what is your definition of critical race theory? Well, here we're into the squishiness. Um, because, as, as was pointed out, critical race theory is a, a framework that emanates out of law schools, uh, a way of seeing and understanding America's past and America's present. It is simply saying that you have to take race and racism seriously uh, as factors and forces in shaping the contours of the lives of all American people and consider the ways in which it intersects with other identities, with people's gender identity, with sex and the like. Uh, and so, uh, contrary to what many people have said, that this is uh, somehow promoting one race over another, it actually is doing just the opposite. Uh, it's saying that race itself as an idea, as a construct, actually isn't real, but racism is real. And we have to take that very seriously if we want to make sense of the world in which we live. Mr. Stover, what's your reaction to that? You know, I, uh, it, it may, may surprise you to, uh, to know, Russ, that uh, I had an opportunity to take a look at a few of uh, Dr. Jeffrey's uh, YouTube videos. And uh, I have no problem at all when it comes to hard history. I really don't. As long as the history is being told, that's the main thing, is that it's being told, being told properly, and it is true history. But to look at children, to um, basically state to them that based upon the color of your skin, we are now going to determine who is going to be, as I mentioned before, the oppressed and the oppressor. You know, it was, um, I believe, August of 63 when uh, Dr. Martin Luther King basically said that we need to judge those on the character of their being, of yeah, their person. The content of their, their character. It's a great theory. <laughs> it certainly is, but let me ask you, give, give, give me an example of something that you think is out of bounds that you say is being taught in schools right now. Well, I, I would say this. Uh, CRT uh, was promoted uh, by the uh, state board uh, resolution 20 by the State Board of Education passed this last year and um, I did not uh, bring it here for this interview, but I did provide you a copy. And uh, that's something that the, not all members, but out of the 19 members that serve on the state board, I believe it was 14 or 15 that voted in favor of it. Um, talks about white privilege and all those terms that are certainly concerning not only to myself, but then also to those that have children in the public school system, as well as those that are non-white. I mean, I think I sent you a couple of videos that have to do with uh, blacks throughout the entire country that are speaking out against critical race theory because it's divisive. Yeah. And that's, and that's the concern that I have. Is there something specific, you've great, great examples there, is there something specific that you've seen taught in a school district that you think is just totally out of bounds. You know, when you look at uh, the videos that we have on our website, Russ, uh, many people uh, come to us throughout the entire state regarding things that they have found in the, um, in the schools. And, um, this, uh, and the one that, once again, that, I, that I'm mentioning here is the, I mean, you look at the Mad River School District. And I, I'd like to, uh, like to give you this quote because this is, this is certainly concerning and alarming. But it was stated by a teacher that, uh, a white teacher, I'm ashamed of my white privileged skin. Ashamed of my white brothers and sisters with their small minds killing my innocent brothers and sisters because of color. And this is something that should not be taught to our children. We need to be bringing people together, 
not attempting to divide them apart. And when we, we, when we look at the term white privilege, uh, Dr. Jeffries uh, being a, uh, uh, and I did also cap in the kitchen your, uh, your video when you visited the home of James Madison. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting video. Uh, going back to hard history, mm -hmm. something that I support. But uh, when, it, when it comes to teaching children these type of divisive terms, this is something that I, along with many people in the state of Ohio, are concerned with. Professor Jeffries, your response to that? Well, what some people would consider divisive, uh, academics would consider points of understanding. Uh, I think it is, it, is, it is clear and obvious throughout the country that K through 12 ch schools are not teaching critical race theory. Uh, that is an academic framework for understanding the world that is literally not in the public school system. But that doesn't mean that race and racism and understanding it is not being taught and should not be taught, should not be uh, 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 taught in the classroom. But when we think about how that is framed in those conversations, nobody's telling uh, little white kids that they ought to be ashamed of themselves or hold and harbor shame for things in the past. But they are saying you have to understand how we all got here, the role of race in society, why our schools and their composition look the way they do. Uh, these are critical things to helping students understand the past and the present. It's not about creating shame. Uh, it's about creating understanding for the world in which we live. Mr. Stover, should, uh, do you think that kids should be told the perspective of the impact of race in America? Uh, Russ, I believe that children, as uh, we've used the term hard history, I think it's a good term. I wish I would have thought of it, to be quite honest with you, but I did not. But uh, when it comes to hard history, I believe that history should be taught of our past well, in this country. Yeah, history is one thing. I guess, I guess what I'm picking up on with the Dr. Jeffries is saying the perspective of the impact on race in America. It's one thing to teach about this or that, but there's a perspective involved is there as well. Do you have an issue with that at all? I have, I have an issue once again, and uh, I would suggest um, going to protectohiochildren.net, uh, which is our website, and we have a number of videos from parents throughout the state of Ohio that have gone to school districts. Um, you go to YouTube and uh, nothing more than just key in critical race theory in the schools, and uh, you, will, you will see what is being taught. I, I do disagree with uh, Dr. Jeffries on the fact that uh, it's not being taught. It is being taught. And uh, you even have had the uh, National Education Association head basically say, look, we'll defend any teacher that uh, decides that they're going to uh, teach it. We have, we have had, I believe it's five to six states in this country that have already passed legislation. In the state of Ohio, we have um, House Bill 327 that uh, is currently in committee. And I'm sure it's going to be discussed by the uh, General Assembly whenever they return here next month. So I disagree that it's not being taught. I believe it is. Professor? We see that these bills that are in the General Assembly that are working their way uh, are, are, are bills uh, that are in search of a problem. Uh, this copycat legislation that we have seen uh, popping up around the country. Uh, and so I don't think we can point to the legislation and say because there are bills uh, in the assembly that there is evidence that there is actually a problem. Uh, we also understand that this furor, this hysteria around critical race theory is really a response uh, to the grassroots mobilization by millions of people in the summer of 2020 uh, as th who took to the streets uh, calling for justice not only for the victims of police violence, but also for an end to systemic racism, for the ways in which systems and structures in our society continue to perpetuate inequality on the basis of race. And so when the State Board of Education uh, passed uh, a resolution, a very strong resolution, that doesn't mention critical race theory, but says that we owe our students, uh, a, we have a responsibility to our students to tell them the truth about the past and to make sure that we are not continuing to perpetuate inequality, which the state itself has contributed to over the, over the decades. And that isn't about creating harm. Uh, that is about being honest about not just the past, but also the present. I mentioned the perspective of the impact of race in America. You could be more, I'm sure you're much more elegant about that, explaining that than I can. When you talk about the perspective of the impact of race, what are we saying exactly? Well, we have to take it seriously. I mean, one of the things that 
uh, many proponents uh, of, uh, who, who are advocating that we don't talk about race and racism that fall under the umbrella of this sort of the mysterious critical race theory at this point, uh, is that somehow you know, just talking about race and racism is the problem. Talking about race and racism isn't a problem. Discriminating against people on the basis of race and racism is, is the problem. We are all impacted and influenced by our racial identity. That doesn't mean that those who say we have to take this seriously believe that race itself is real. It's biologically meaningless, but it is socially meaningful. And at the same time, it is also culturally relevant because it reflects, we use it in America as a stand-in for cultural ancestry and cultural heritage. And so when we fall into the colorblind trap and pretend as though we don't see race, pretend as though race doesn't continue to inform our lives and hasn't informed our, our, our lives coming up until this point, then for, as a person of color, as an African American, what you're actually saying to me is you don't see me because you're saying that my experiences, my, ex my parents' experience, my grandparents' experience somehow don't continue to inform who I am today. So we have to take race seriously if we want to treat each other as human beings, if we want to take each other's experiences as serious in informing how they live their lives and walk through the world. Mr. Stover, do you have a problem with what the professor just said? No, not, not at all in many respects. I believe that we, uh, we need to uh, be concerned with uh, everyone's past. Uh, we need to take it seriously. One of the videos of uh, Dr. Jeffries that I have to admit I was a little concerned with was the um, Southeast Ohioan white um, drinking motor oil. I mean, oh, it was a joke, but I would say this, that, you know, I, I found it to be rather troubling, only from the perspective, doctor, that I myself, my father um, grew up in the 30s in Appalachia, West Virginia, very, very poor. Many, many times he didn't, uh, he didn't have a, a bite to eat before going to bed and uh, did not have running water in his home, did not have uh, indoor plumbing, et cetera. So I can appreciate that. And as a young boy, I saw that. So, no, I agree with the uh, doctor. I think that we need to appreciate and we need to have these discussions. I am just concerned once again when it comes to what we see in the schools. And I disagree 100% with uh, Dr. Jeffries as relates to what is being taught because we have had parents contact us. The videos are out there where, uh, and we've seen them, some of us have seen quite a few. I have, uh, Russ, and uh, it's, it's troubling. It really is. Whenever you have a, uh, a black gentleman with the video that I sent to you, basically standing up at a school board meeting and saying, you know, I have a concern with what you're teaching my children. Um, my children's mother is sitting in the back and she's white. And you're causing division here in our own household regarding some of the things that you're, you're teaching my child. So I do say we need to be cognizant of uh, one another and our background, just as, I, I, once again, with Dr. Jeffries, I firmly believe that I could, I could take him out to lunch and we would sit around the table and breaking bread and we would have a excellent time together. Though we disagree in some areas, we uh, agree in other areas as well. Yeah, uh, of course. I have not seen the motor oil video. I, I don't know. If, is, that some, is, that, is that something? Well, let me explain. About? Let me explain. Okay. Here we were talking about, uh, I was trying to explain uh, white privilege, okay. uh, and, uh, and, which is one of these so-called divisive topics, right? Divisive issues when people talk about white privilege. Uh, I see it and others see it as white privilege as being something real. Um, but it's called white privilege. It's not called white guarantee. If you are a white person in America, uh, you are not guaranteed to be successful. You are not guaranteed to be wealthy. We know historically that white folk have been catching heck uh, throughout uh, the history of this nation. We understand that. Uh, but the privilege aspect is that if you are white, you have the privilege of not having to deal with certain obstacles because you are black or brown because you are African-American. So that doesn't mean uh, that if you grew up poor in Southeast Ohio, or you grew up working class poor in New York City, uh, that you were guaranteed to be successful. But it does mean that there were certain privileges inherent to you solely because of your skin color, things that you didn't have to do. You could walk into a bank. It wasn't you weren't guaranteed to get the loan, but you were guaranteed to get a hearing. If you were black, you could walk into that same bank and you had no choice. You had no, there was, there was no hope for you whatsoever. That I think is the difference. And we have to own that. 
We have to realize and recognize that, that that still plays a legacy. Where you could buy a home, who could buy a home, still influences who our neighborhoods, who lives in our neighborhoods today. That's the privilege aspect. And that, that's not about blame. That's not about putting shame on anybody. That's just saying, hey, this is the way America has, has, has been built, the way America has been shaped. And we need to own that so that we can move forward together. But we can't move forward together unless we are honest about how we got here in the first place. Mr. Stover, do you think that white privilege exists in this country? Interesting question. I would say that at one time, I would, I would state 100% that it existed. Today, I don't see white privilege being as pronounced as Dr. Jeffries. Now, when you have discrimination, I mean, we could start looking at different nationalities that, would, uh, that could be here today, whether it be the Irish, et cetera, that would say, you know what, there was a time when I was discriminated against whenever I came to this country. Um, I, I feel strongly that uh, in some respects that uh, there are other nationalities that have been discriminated against. Um, you know, I look at my, my, my grandfather. My grandfather was paid when he worked in the mines in West Virginia. He was paid in script. And many people I talk to, they have no idea what script is. Um, you've heard of the company store? Well, he was, uh, he, had, uh, he was involved with what I would consider to be economic discrimination because of the fact that uh, that was the way that he was treated. So I don't agree with it as being uh, the, uh, the uh, systemic racism that Dr. Jeffries, I know, from what it appears that he embraces. But I, I do believe that it's there. And it's something that we need to continue to work on. I, I don't disagree with that. And I believe that we need to deal with history in the classroom. And if it's a hard history, I, I found it fascinating, James Madison, that segment. I really did. I mean, because there were a few things in there that I did not know about regarding James Madison and his home and the, and the bricks. As you mm -hmm. said, run your fingers along the bricks here. Uh, and the children were making the yeah. bricks, black children. Well, let me, uh, when you say hard history, let me use a term that we use in TV. Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts, no perspective. Is that what you're saying? I, I, would, I would say that. Um, you know, I, 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 will, I look at some of the history of our country. One of, the, one of the greatest historians I feel that we have today in our country, and unfortunately, even our own State Board of Education really did not want to hear from him. And I found it to be quite appalling is um, uh, Wall Builders uh, founder, David Barton. David Barton and the book that I provided you earlier regarding Bulletproof George Washington, never knew that story. Never knew that story in high school, junior high, elementary. It was never told. And those are some of the hard history lessons that we need to learn relative to George Washington and the divine providence that God put his hand upon him in that uh, battle in 1757. But again, I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. It, you're, you're, when you say hard history, you're saying teach kids just the facts. No perspective. This is what happened. End of story. A a absolutely. I have no problem at all with that. Professor? Well, I, I consider hard history to be those aspects of our past that make us uncomfortable in the present. Um, you know, when we think about the founders, uh, and their relationship to the institution of slavery, and their embedding into our legal framework from the very beginning, uh, protections for the institution of slavery. We don't want to talk about that uh, because it makes us uncomfortable in the present. So these are facts that we need to discuss, that we need to make sure our students are able to wrap their minds around, that there was a big, there was a yawning gap uh, between all men are created equal written down and the efforts to preserve and maintain the institution of slavery almost for another century. Uh, and so, yes, there are facts that we need to talk about that historically we have just overlooked, we have ignored, uh, that we have purposefully uh, forgotten. Uh, and my fear uh, with the movement that we have now falling under this anti-critical race theory umbrella uh, is that it will have a chilling effect on teachers, whether or not that legislation uh, passes uh, or not, it will have a chilling effect because they won't know what to do. They won't know what might be the consequences uh, simply for stating the facts, simply for talking about history honestly, and then also making the connection. I don't think we can just talk about the past in isolation. I think we have to talk about the past and connect it to the present. 
And this is one of the things that's very troubling, uh, this push uh, to not talk about current issues, uh, because somehow that is uh, uh, imposing uh, beliefs and ideas. No, no, that's what we're supposed to be doing in terms of dialoguing and engaging and making informed citizens for the future. Because uh, I, 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 you know, I, I, I just wonder, right? Well, if we can acknowledge that racism existed in the past uh, and that we have problems in the past, but at the same time we're going to say, well, it's not really influencing us now. Well, when did it stop? What's the year? W when's that moment? Because I missed that in class and in the present. And so I think it's hard to pinpoint because it didn't. It shapes, it changes, it evolves, but it is still with us. We haven't reached that moment where we can just turn our back on it and say, you know what, that is in the past. Did you struggle? What's your reaction to that? You know, I, I, well, once again, I would, I would say that uh, to a great, um, um, great deal, I agree. I mean, but, but here's, here's once again where I believe we're drawing the line, and I'm not speaking for Dr. Jeffries. I draw the line when it comes to, once again, the classroom, especially in the primary education, especially, but all through, you know, K through 12, is whenever we want to start looking at, once again, one race against another. I mean, I've heard it uh, said in the classroom um, that uh, you won the lottery when you were born white. That's a quote. You were won the lottery. Um, and that's being stated to children. When you say it's being stated, is that, is this being stated in many classrooms across the country? It, it, well, specific examples you're talking about? Well, or or being, is well, this something that's prevalent throughout school districts? Uh, all, I, all I know is the parents that contact us and contact our organization, we've put a uh, heat map that's out there now for uh, people in the state of Ohio so that if, if we get a tip on something, whatever it might be, whether it's in the classroom, uh, material, whatever it might be, then we will, in fact, um, put it out there on our heat map. Uh, I mean, there, once again, there are many, many concerns that parents have, not only white parents, but black parents as well, and those of color. They, they, they contact us and they say, you know, this is just not right, what is being taught. And uh, many times, I mean, you take a look at some of the videos in Beechwood, we had a school board meeting in which it was taped, and I would say probably 35, 40% of those that came up to speak were those of color and said, you know what, this is a problem. This is a problem, what you're teaching our children. So I agree that racism exists. We need to continue to do what we can, but that's racism as it relates to all people. You know, I mean, we need to teach our children just because somebody is, you know, Billy over here is, you know, weighs 50, 60, 70 pounds more than what he should, and he's morbidly obese for his age, you know, we need to make sure that, look, we don't discriminate against Billy in the classroom. So there's a number of different things that when it comes to discrimination that we need to be cognizant of, we need to teach our children, but we certainly don't want to be looking at pitting one race against the other. Let me uh, move on for a second, but let me just kind of throw something out there and just, just so I can kind of understand it uh, a little better. I hear what both of you are saying, but let's take an issue like slavery, a hard fact. Slavery existed, you know, in this country. Do you have a problem with the issue of the impact of slavery, the effect of slavery being taught? I, I, I feel that it should be taught uh, all the way up uh, from the beginning up until uh, 1865. I feel the, uh, the, should, the, the decision of the Southern Court regarding Dred Scott should be taught. Um, I, I, I firmly believe that if I was living during that time, that I would have been part of the uh, Underground Railroad and part of the abolitionist movement because any type of slavery is wrong, period. So I, I, I firmly, firmly agree. So that slavery that being taught, you're, you're cool with. Absolutely. But the impact of slavery after 19, 1865 Got a problem with well, that. no, no, no. I, I'm not even saying afterwards because once again, we're still dealing with we're still dealing with as I believe this is the area that Dr. Jeffries and I would agree that we still have a certain type of racism that takes place within our society, but it's how we present it. That's the important element here. Extremely important is how it's presented. We don't want to pit one race against the other, especially when you start talking about small children, because you can't you can't you know look at look at uh, the white children in the class and have a teacher stand up and say, 
you know, uh, those of you that are white, you were born privileged. Those that are not, you were not born privileged. That's just not the way that we should be teaching our children. So again, just so I understand it, if, if a teacher says uh, to a student that there was an impact of slavery, black people suffered because of slavery, here's how, one, two, three, four, five, go down the line. You're okay with that? Absolutely. If, 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 it's, if it's history, I have no problem at all with it. Absolutely. Mm. Let me throw the word equity out in another uh, squishy term <laughs> these days. What does equity mean to you, Mr. Stover? Uh, equality and equity, uh, two different things. Two separate things. I believe 100% in equality. I, I embrace equality. When it comes to equity, I do have a concern there. I tell you, I tell you why. Okay, whenever I was playing basketball in high school, I was, though six feet, I was a short white guy. Okay, and that goes without saying. I did not look to the coach, or I did not look to the school district, the athletic director, to remedy that and see to it that that um, you know we had all six foot, you know. Of, of whatever color playing on our team. The equality, when you, when you look at it, everyone has an opportunity. But you don't, our society should not specifically direct outcomes that are going to be for all. You know, it, it was just reported about the uh, Stowe uh, School District and, uh, and the uh, math department when the teachers decided that, you know, we're going to have to do away with some of the testing. This was reported in the Akron Beacon Journal just this, year, just this past year. We have to do away with some of the testing because what we find, our Asian and white children are doing better than those of color. Uh -huh. And we need to bring the standards down so that we have an equitable playing field when it comes to math. So those are areas that, um, that I see the difference between equity and equality. Professor, what's the definition of equity in your mind? Well, I think you have to put it in conversation with equality. Um, I believe in equality as well, and I think that's a, a, a point of uh, a common ground. Uh, but I don't think we can profess to believe in equality and not be willing to engage and create and support programs that will lead to equity. See, the, the equity is the programmatic side of equality. It's how can you create equality if we're on this uneven playing field. It is not enough simply to look at a population, any group, doesn't matter, whether you're talking about African Americans, people of color, whether you're talking about poor white folks somewhere in America, and say, okay, now we're just gonna, everybody's equal, right? We're just gonna do the same things, right? And folk don't have the resources necessary to get them to that equal level. And so I don't think we can actually have equality without doing the programs that are necessary to have equity. Now, the sports analogy I get, I like basketball too, and I wasn't six feet, right? But we're not talking about, we're talking about life outcomes here, right? We're not just talking about the, the uh, you know, a, a sports game, right? I mean, this is, this is really life and death for a lot of folk. And if we accept, and this is where I think we have to go back to sort of when is that moment where things change? If we accept that there historically has been disadvantage based upon race, disadvantage based upon class, disadvantage uh, based upon uh, gender, and creating opportunities for some that others weren't, then at a certain point we have to say, okay, when, even if we've erased the bias in our own individual minds, if we still have created this uneven uh, playing field up until this point, what are we going to do about it? so that we don't lose another generation. And I don't think that's divisive. I don't think that's putting anybody against each other. This isn't a zero-sum game. This is America. We're the wealthiest country in the world, right? We can do what we want and still have enough for everybody. When uh, Mr. Silver uses the word divisive, as you just used, what, what goes through your head? What do, you, what do you think about when you hear that word? I think the term itself is divisive, right? Uh, because talking about these issues, I don't think is divisive at all. I think it's healthy. Uh, in a democratic society, to talk about uh, the things that have created problems in the past and in the present. I think these are exactly the difficult, uncomfortable conversations that we need to be leaning into so that we can move past them. We can't move past them. We can't address them unless we have an honest conversation about them. And I think too much of it sort of falls under this, you know, the term divisive, divisive. divisive. What's divisive? I mean, this is America. Look, American history is divisive. Right? I mean, the, you, we look at the way African Americans were treated. We look at the way women were treated. We look at the way Native Americans. We look at the way immigrants have been treated all this time. That's divisive. 
I think we need, the way to come together is actually to lean into and not pretend as though there aren't difficult issues and problems in the past and not pretend that they don't continue to inform us in the present. We have to talk about slavery up until 1865 when it's abolished, absolutely. But we do have to talk about its principal legacy, which was the justification of slavery, which was a belief in white supremacy. We can't pretend as though that didn't exist. We have to teach and talk about it. Mr. Stoker? You know, I have no problem at all talking about it. I, I, I agree with you, doctor. We need to talk about it and the divisiveness that it does bring in that discussion. No problem at all. Whenever you have men of academic means or, or you just have, you know, a couple of people talking about it over the fence in the neighborhood they live in. Where I have an issue is I have a problem. Let me use another term here we haven't used yet. And many people talk about this, that uh, contact our organization is the indoctrination. We're talking about children now. These are not adults talking about this, Dr. Jeffries. These are children. And we have to be careful that we're not slanting their mindset as it relates to their you know, vulnerability as being a child. So this is where I have an, a major issue. I have no problem at all discussing it. I think it needs to be discussed in whatever areas of discrimination that we may be uh, making reference to. Professor, what's your response to that? I think we, the way to talk about it, the way to have uh, effective conversations, uh, is not just to have them across the fence. We need those conversations. We need those community conversations as well. But we have to start talking to, and this is where we disagree, we have to start talking to children in age-appropriate ways at the earliest ages. I mean, social psychologists tell us that children as young as two and three months old are able to distinguish people based upon race because of the cues and clues that they're giving, that they're picking up from their caregivers. So it's not that even children, they see it. And by four and five, they're picking up on, they're associating certain beliefs and behaviors with race. And so we're pretending that they don't when they actually do. And so I think the way to have really productive conversations is to begin to introduce the obvious and talk about the obvious with children as young learners and then make it more complicated, then add to it as they progress through school. The, the, there's a group in Tennessee uh, that, is, that has identified uh, a picture book by Ruby Bridges. Ruby Bridges was a six-year-old child who uh, desegregated the New Orleans public schools and on her first days, uh, famously captured in the Norman Rockwell painting. I mean, you have a jeering crowd uh, of white folk uh, who are opposed to this young child, one little black child going to school, and they're screaming racial epithets at her and the like. And she spends the whole year in school by herself with one white teacher, right? I mean, this is an amazing story of perseverance and what we had to deal with in dealing with education. But this group is opposed to it because they don't like the way the white mob is portrayed. Well, what's a nice way to portray a white mob that is trying to keep a six-year-old girl from going to school? And that's, I think, the slippery slope that we're already sliding down. This is history, yes, but then it's history that continues to inform why our schools look the way they do today and the decision. So, I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful story. It's an it's a, it's a uncomfortable story, but it is a wonderful story to get students and children to lean into, not to say, hey, you're to blame for anything that happened to, that people did in the past, but to say, look, this is who we were, but this is not who we have to be. Mr. Stover? You know, um, I made reference to um, Dr. Jeffrey's uh, video once again regarding James Madison. And one of the things I recall you saying was, uh, Doctor, relative to the tour guide, and I quote, he was a cool white dude. I'm telling you, I look upon Dr. Jeffries as being a cool black dude, and uh, I would have no problem at all sitting down with a, uh, with a mill with him any time but we don't want to discuss this area as far as education is concerned because this is where I, am com I completely disagree. Um, you have to, discussing history, the slavery, just the facts, et cetera, as it relates to children, agree with 100%. It was wrong, slavery was wrong. It's not something that um, our country should be proud of. Definitely not. Some of our uh, founding fathers, they were wrong relative to slavery. I, I could not agree more, but when it comes to the indoctrination of children and the, what I have seen, the pitting of one race against another is where I draw the line. And I believe that we need to wait until it is, I think as Dr. Jeffrey said, age appropriate to get into the more in-depth discussions. 
You guys have a lot in common. You guys disagree clearly on, on some fundamental issues here, but where do you see common ground? Do you see any common ground between what you both are saying? I think you know, we may disagree uh, on what needs to be taught and how early, uh, but I would like to think uh, that we're all concerned about children. We're all concerned about uh, this country uh, and because we're leaving it to them. I mean, the children inherit uh, the future. They inherit this country. Uh, my concern uh, is that we're not preparing them adequately uh, to deal with the problems that we haven't solved ourselves unless we talk honestly, not late in the game, but even early in the game, uh, so that they are adequately prepared. And I, I think if we, if we center the kids, uh, that maybe we can have these conversations and, and build from there going forward. But I don't think it's in the best interest uh, of young people, of children, of this next generation, uh, if we withhold these difficult conversations, because we know that it didn't serve us very well. Uh, we have a long history of public education indoctrination, uh, but it's not from those who are saying we have to talk about race and racism. It's from those like the Daughters of the Confederacy who for decades uh, censored uh, what was taught in the classrooms and went into textbooks in America. So we know what it is. We know what it looks like. And I would just respectfully disagree that this ain't that. Mr. Stover? You know, in, um, I attended high school from 1971 to 74 on the near west side of Cleveland and went to Lincoln West High School. And um, we were as racially mixed as you will find any high school. When we were attending high school, you know, I have to admit, I looked upon it as I think many of my classmates looked upon dealing with those of the opposite race. I had extremely good friends that were black, extremely good friends that were uh, Latino, Puerto Rican, etc. And the words of Jesus when he said, he said, love thy neighbor as thyself. That was something that I think most of us looked at and we said, Yes, well, that's what we need to do. We need to be teaching our children that, you know, we, we, we need to count others and esteem them higher, as the scripture states, than we do ourselves. And I think this is something that we need to be teaching our children in the early ages, in the early grades in our public schools. And I guess the, the, the real question, um, Russ and Dr. Jeffries, comes down to this, in my mind, who ultimately has the right to see that their children are educated and what they are taught. And uh, if we believe that it's the, the state, which I do not, or the federal government, as far as the programs that they put in place, but I believe it's the parents. And I, I believe the parents, based upon their value that they have want to see ascribed into their children, they ultimately have that. Right, and this is why we see many parents, they're going to homeschooling, they're going to private school, going to Christian school when it comes to the education of their children. You get the last word here on this one, Professor. I think we have to be very careful uh, when we talk about uh, legislating what is taught in the classroom, uh, because this proposed legislation uh, has uh, real world consequences uh, not only for teachers, and myself included as a state employee at The Ohio State University and infringing upon academic freedom uh, for what I can teach students who come through, uh, but then also the potential chilling effect uh, that it can have uh, on, what our, uh, uh, on what teachers teach in the classroom, which inevitably will impact our children. I, I, you know, in, in, in a very real way, I think this hysteria around this topic uh, is politically driven. Uh, and it's unfortunate because the people who are paying the ultimate cost for this politics is our children. Uh, and the children shouldn't be tossed around like a political football. We should all rally around the idea of making sure they receive the education that they deserve, that equips them to deal with the issues in the present and prepares them to deal with the issues in the future. Do me a favor, when you do sit down for that meal, please invite me, because I'd like to be there for that, the interesting conversation. I, you know good. what? I will make sure that I pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank really you. Appreciate Thank it. you.